great sermons of the 20th century would not be complete if it did not include the ministry of Dr. W. A. Criswell, pastor of the First Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas, and president of the Southern Baptist Convention. We count it an honor to bring this message to you today by way of recording, believing that you will be enriched, your life will be strengthened with this powerful message from the Word of God. Dr. W. A. Criswell. And the day, the day our Lord was crucified, it is Mount Calvary, the Mount of Atonement. In the 27th chapter of the book of Matthew, and when they came unto a place called Golgotha, the place of a skull, Calvary, there they crucified him. And in the ninth chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. This gospel of atonement, of the washing away of our sins, is repudiated by the world. To them it is butcher shop religion. It is gross superstition. It is a holdover from animistic days. The gospel of redemption to the world is superfluous. And they say so brutally, rudely, and bluntly. If we have tractors, they say, to remove mountains, we don't need faith. If we have penicillin, we don't need prayer. If we have positive thinking, we don't need salvation. If we have the state, we don't need the church. If we have manuals of science, we don't need the Bible. And if we have an Einstein or an Edison, we don't need Jesus. As you follow their thought and reasoning, you can easily see that they define and interpret life in terms of materialities, secularism. It is true that the Christian religion addresses itself to redemption, that is, the true faith and the true Christian message. It has to do with the human heart it has to do with regeneration. It has to do with the forgiveness of our sins. And that is why materialities can never approach it. What can penicillin, our tractors, our governmental agencies do in the forgiveness of sin and in the regeneration of the human heart? The true faith, the true Christian religion, is of all things first and foremost a gospel and a message of redemption. The changing of the human heart, the saving of the human soul. The Christian faith is not first an epic, although it is ethical. It is not in the first place a theology, although it is theological. Nor is it in the first place and primarily reformational, although it has cultural and social and political overtones. But the Christian faith is first and foremost, and above all else, a message of salvation. How can a man be changed? You can see this poignantly in the sign of the Christian church. The sign of the church, of the gospel, is not a burning bush, nor is it two tables of stone on which are written commandments, nor is it a Shekinah fire 
nor is it a seven-branch lampstand, nor is it a halo above a submissive head, nor is it even a golden crown, but the sign of the Christian church and the Christian message is a cross, a rugged cross in all of its naked hideousness, as the Roman would have it, in all of its philosophical irrationality, as the Greek would have it, but in all of its power to save, as Paul would have it. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? How could such a thing be that God in the flesh should be crucified, executed like a criminal? What is it? Is it? A dramatic play, like the Agamemnon of Aeschylus, like Shakespeare's King Lear or Macbeth, or Eugene O'Neill's strange interlude. What is this? Is it an historical tragedy, like Socrates breaking the hemlock, or Julius Caesar murdered at the statue of Pompey? Or like Abraham Lincoln, assassinated in Ford's theater? What is this that happened on Golgotha? Is it a failure and a defeat? Albert Schweitzer, the great philanthropist and missionary doctor, was also a theologian, but a strange one to me. In the days of his young manhood, he wrote one of the great theological books of the generation entitled The Quest for the Historical Jesus. And the thesis of the book is this, that the Lord expected the descent of the kingdom of heaven. And when it didn't come, when it didn't descend, that he died in frustration and defeat and disillusionment and failure. Is that correct? What is this, the death of the Son of God on the cross? The Bible answers. It is first the judgment of God upon our sins. What is sin like? It's gross visage and its terrible repercussions can be found most dramatically and most poignantly in the death of the Son of God on the cross. What sin is like and what sin does. Who crucified the Lord Jesus? Whose fault was it? Well, it's his own fault. He should have been a better manager. It was Judas's fault. He's the one that sold him, betrayed him. It was Pontius Pilate's fault. He was a weak and vacillating ruler, and he delivered him to crucifixion. No, it was the Jews' fault. They're the ones that accused him and delivered him up. No, it was the Roman soldiers' fault. They're the ones that drove in the nails and pierced his side. I can hear the cry of Pontius Pilate to this day as he washed his hands in water I am innocent from the blood of this just man, see you to it. I can hear the cry of the Jew for 2,000 years of anti-Semitism. It is not our fault. We did it not. I can hear the Roman soldiers respond. We are but men under authority. We didn't do it. It must have been we all had a part. It must have been that our sins nailed him to the tree, and our sins pressed upon his brow the crown of thorns. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. 
It is not only a portrayal of sin, but the cross of Christ is also God's atoning grace and mercy that we might be forgiven. It is the answer to the cry of Job, I have sinned, what shall I do? It is the answer to the cry of Macbeth, Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No rather, this my hand will the multitude of seas incarnate and making the green one red. It is the answer of the great Christian hymn. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. This is the Passover Lamb. This is the suffering servant of Isaiah. This is the blood of the covenant shed for the remission of sins. This is God's atoning, atoning mercy worked out through the ages, and this is the consummation toward which all time and history do move. And Jesus bowed his head and cried, saying, It is finished. It is finished. And the blood that fell on the dust around the cross cried to the grass, it is finished. And the grass around the cross cried to the herbs, it is finished. And the herbs cried to the trees, it is finished. And the trees cried to the birds in the branches, it is finished. And the birds spiraling upward cried to the clouds, it is finished. And the clouds cried to the stars, it is finished. And the stars cried to the angels in heaven, it is finished. And the angels in glory went up and down the streets of the new Jerusalem, crying, it is finished. God's atoning grace worked out in history for the forgiveness of our sins. And that cross, that Golgotha, that Calvary, is the sign of our hope and our salvation. A cross with its arms outstretched, wide as the world is wide, as far as the east goes east and the west goes west, so the arms of God's love and mercy are outstretched. And it includes even me. There's room at the cross for me. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There is room at the cross for me. And that cross is the sign of our eternal hope and assurance in Christ Jesus. If in Flanders fields the poppies grow, it will be between the crosses, row on row, a sign of the hope we have in God. There could be no other way. Could my tears forever flow could my zeal no languor know? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. In my hand no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling, and it is enough. God says it is enough. When I see the blood, I will pass over. These are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood 
of the Lamb. Ere since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply, redeeming grace has been my theme and shall be till I die. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save when this poor, lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. This shall be the song of our praise to Jesus forever and ever. Unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, to him be honor and power and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen and amen. And our Lord, in deepest humility, bowing at the foot of the cross, with all the love and adoration of our hearts, we thank God this day, this Friday day, this day of the cross and the crucifixion, we thank God for the love and grace that brought such salvation and forgiveness to our souls. Make us new. Make us Christian. Make us God's true servants as we face the assignments that remain to us in our pilgrimage that we might honor our Lord as our Lord honored thee in giving his life unto death, that we might be saved in praise, in thanksgiving, in his holy name, amen. And today it is Mount Olivet, the mount of our Lord's return. And I rarely ever announce an outline, but this one I shall. I speak first of the place, then of the promise, then of the person. Mount Olivet, the mount on the eastern side of Jerusalem, just beyond the Kidron Valley. Mount Olivet the mount of our Lord's return. When Jesus comes back to this earth, where will it be? The place is specifically, <coughs> prophetically identified. I read from the prophet Zechariah, chapter 14, the last chapter. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Lord our God shall come, and all his saints with him. And it shall come to pass that at even time it shall be light, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Now, once again, in the concluding story, in the story of the concluding day of the Lord in this earth before his ascension into heaven, and he led them out to the Mount of Olives. And after he had given them once again the Great Commission, when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men, two angels, stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus. This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner 
in the same way shall he descend as ye have seen him ascend into glory. The plea is specifically identified in the same way that prophecy identified, specified, spelled out, pointed out, designated the place of our Lord's first coming into this earth. In Micah, the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, And thou, Bethlehem, though thou be little among the cities of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come, who shall govern my people Israel, whose goings forth were from everlasting, the eternal God, the pre-existent, pre-incarnate Lord Christ. In Bethlehem, just a part of the historical association of the Christian faith with, with men, it is not esoteric, it is not removed, it is not metaphysical, it is historical. It happened in the story of mankind. Just so is the place of our Lord's return specifically, prophetically designated. When the Lord comes back, as prophecy said where he would be born when he came the first time, so God's word says the place where he shall descend when he returns the second time. Mount Olivet, the mount of our Lord's return. Now I speak of the promise. There must have been psychologically, rationally, anybody who would read history at all would be forced to ask, there must have been a reason how and why the first century Christians who were so mercilessly persecuted, how they endured the faggot and the fire and the Roman Colosseum and the lion and the beast and the dungeon, and the scourging, and the crucifixion. How could they face such tragic decimation without some tremendous explanation, some reason? Men don't die triumphantly without a cause, without a reason. But these early Christians sang as they were eaten up by wild beasts. They prayed as they were crucified. They were triumphant as they rotted in dungeons or were beat to death. As you know, Nero dipped them in oil and used them as living torches while he rode furiously up and down the streets of Rome, driving his chariot. Yet those early Christians died in victory, in triumph. There has to be a reason. And the reason is not hard to find. They believe a creed prophecy. Jesus is coming again. Not Kurios Caesar, Lord Caesar, but Kurios Yeshu, the Lord Jesus. He is coming again. As Paul expressed it, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now, but now, then the resurrection and the day of triumph and the personal appearing of the Lord. If you were carefully to follow through the philosophies of men and other religions, you would find 
that they're like a bridge over a gray abyss, and they stop in the middle of the abyss. But the distinction and the glory of the Christian faith is the bridge is anchored in time. It is anchored in history. Jesus is a historical person. And he is also divine deity. And the bridge not only starts here where we are and goes up to and over the vast abyss of death and eternity, but it has a ground, a foundation, a landing on the other side. And that other side is the promise of the return of our Lord in glory. Now the promise of the coming again of Christ is woven into the very woof and warp of the Christian faith. You could not disassociate it, untangle the skein without destroying the religion itself. Follow it through for just a moment. In the most precious of all the passages in the Bible, our Lord said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, rise first, and we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord, we, we all shall be changed and caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with our blessed Savior. Listen to the author of the Hebrews as he says, Christ was once offered for the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time apart from sin unto salvation. Listen to the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, James the Lord's brother. Be patient. Establish your heart for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Listen to Simon Peter, the chief apostle, as he says, there shall come in the last days scoffers who shall say, where is the sign of his coming? I hear that today by the unbelieving people. There's no sign of the coming of Christ. Where is the sign? And he doesn't know it, but he's one himself just standing there. There shall come in the last day scoffers saying, where is the promise of his coming? But this they don't realize that a thousand years on God's clock is as a day, and a day is a thousand years. By God's time, please, the Lord's been gone two days. He may come the third. Listen to Jews as he says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And listen to the apocalypse, the revelation. The text of it is Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also who pierced him, and the families of the earth shall wail because of him. And the benedictory promise of our Lord that closes the book. He which testifieth these things, that surely, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The answering prayer of the sainted apostle John. It may be at midday. It may be at twilight. It may be perchance that the blackness of midnight will burst into light in the blaze of his glory when Jesus comes for his fall. Oh, joy, oh, delight, should we go without dying. No sickness, no sadness, no dread and no crying. Caught up through the clouds to meet our Lord in his glory when Jesus comes for his own. The promise. Who is this that is coming? Whom am I to expect? And it is here, more than in any other area of theology, that you will find the spiritualizer and the rationalist.
they have so spiritualized and they have so rationalized the Word of God until we find the personal return of the Lord almost a forgotten or a repudiated doctrine in the great vast circumference of academic and scholastic who is coming? They identify the coming of Christ with. I give you four examples out of 40 dozen. One, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. They say that was the fulfillment of the coming of Christ. Or they say the diffusion of the gospel in the world is the fulfillment of the promise of the return of our Lord. Or they say it is the development of modern cultural Christian civilization. This is the coming of our Lord, the golden millennial age. Or they say it is fulfilled in the occurrence of death. But our Lord has not lost his identity, nor has he merged it with war or history or providence or death that in these things we should seek to find the fulfillment of that glorious hope. If I go away, I will come again. Who is this I? Verily, verily, I say unto you, I come quickly. Who is this I who is coming back to earth? Why, my brother, that I who spoke those words and that I whom we are expecting is none other than the blessed, holy, heavenly God-man, Christ Jesus, our Savior. We're looking for Him. And when He comes, when the consummation of the age shall usher in his blessed appearance, it will be the blessed Lord Jesus, the same precious face, the same gracious voice, the same nail-pierced hand, the same blessed Jesus. We're to wait for him. We're to expect him. We are to pray for him. Our Lord has not lost his identity. His recognitions are ever the same as he was in the days of his flesh. So is he after his resurrection and his ascension into glory with this exception that now he is immortalized and glorified. But the recognitions of our Lord idiosyncrasies, the personality traits of our Lord are the same now as they were when he walked in Galilee. Mary, after he was raised from the dead, Mary recognized him by the way that he pronounced her name, Mary. She had a way of saying it that was unlike any other intonation, and she recognized him by the way that he pronounced her name. After he was raised from the dead, Peter and John ran into the sepulcher. And the scriptures say, John says, that when he saw the napkin wrapped up and placed in a place by itself, that John believed that he had been raised from the dead. What it meant is this, that John recognized the way Jesus folded up a napkin. He had a certain way of folding it and laying it aside. And when John in that tomb saw that napkin folded up, he recognized a little manner of the blessed Lord Jesus and believed that he was raised from the dead, that Jesus had done it. The two in Emmaus, as they broke bread with the unknown guest, they asked him to say the blessing. And when he said the blessing, they recognized him. 
Jesus had a way, a turn of saying grace at the table. And when he said it, they saw it was Jesus. They recognized him by that little habit of saying grace. And in the 24th chapter of the book of Luke, the disciples couldn't believe for the joy that the Lord himself stood there before them, raised from the dead. And the Lord said, Don't, don't be unbelieving. Look at my hands and my side. And have you here anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of an honeycomb. I was preaching on that one day at our first church, and there was a visitor there who's not like us. And when the service was over, he left and said, how crude and how vulgar and how physical to preach Jesus, raised from the dead, eating a broiled fish and an honeycomb. I believe. Here again, I'm under attack now because I wrote a book entitled Why I Preach That the Bible is Literally True. And they say I am so uncritical and so unscholarly. But the witness of the Holy Scriptures is that it is a real and actual Jesus who is coming back to earth again. He has flesh and bones. He has a body. The great Lord God Christ who sits on the throne of the universe is a man, the man, Christ Jesus. And he has never lost his identity with our race. He is our brother, our great mediator and intercessor the actual Lord Jesus. Stephen saw him as they took away his life there in glory. Paul saw him above the brightness of the sun falling at his feet. Who art thou, Lord? And he replied, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. The Apostle John saw him on the Isle of Patmos. He turned to see the voice that spake to him. And when he turned, he saw the glorified Lord Jesus. There are many who have seen him. The illustrious predecessor in the pulpit of our church here in Dallas, Dr. George W. Truett. Soon after his coming here to be under shepherd of the flock, fell into a grievous sadness. J.C. Arnold, captain of the Texas Rangers, was appointed chief of police of the city of Dallas. And he loved the pastor. He took him for a hunt in Johnson County with the pastor of the first church at Cleburne. And the chief of police of Dallas was walking just in front of Dr. Truett. And Dr. Truett shifted his hammerless shotgun from one arm to the other. And when he did so, it accidentally discharged and fatally wounded Dallas chief of police. And from that wound, he soon died. The whole city was shocked by the death of Police Chief Arnold, but the pastor was plunged into indescribable grief and despair. He said to his wife, I can never preach again. The blood of an innocent man is on my head. And for days, he didn't eat and he didn't sleep. And one night, falling asleep, the Lord Jesus came to him. After he 
appeared to him and said, Fear not, from now on you're to be my messenger and my man. And he awakened and told his wife. He went back to sleep, and the second time the Lord Jesus appeared to him. And he told his wife, he dropped into sleep again, and the third time the Lord Jesus appeared to him. Fear not. From now on, you're to be my messenger and my man. And when the announcement was made over the city of Dallas, Troy, will preach again. The Presbyterian and the Methodist and the other churches in the city of Dallas dismiss their services in order to hear the word and the testimony of the great pastor. Jesus lives. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is somebody. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is in heaven. Our mediator and intercessor. And it's Jesus we want to see. To have a letter from him is not enough like the seven letters to the churches in Asia. To have a story of his life is not enough. The Gospels we read, his words of wisdom, even the Holy Spirit in our hearts, not enough. We want to see Jesus someday, like the Greeks who came to the feast stars, we would see Jesus. It's Jesus we want to see. And it is Jesus someday we're going to see personally. Face to face. Like the face of Job. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and though through my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom mine eyes shall see, and not another. It's like that so oft repeated imagery in the Bible the bride and the groom. When they're separated, how unhappy and lonely, and how I look forward to a rendezvous when the bride and the bridegroom sit down together. We shall do that at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's Jesus we want to see, and it's Jesus someday we're going to. He is coming again. Ah, oh, Lord, there are 10,000 things that buffet our faith. Sometimes we're discouraged. The trials of the pilgrimage of this life leave us lonely and forlorn, but he has not forgotten us. He will faithfully keep the promise he made. I will come again. And our answering prayer is that of the sainted apostle John. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. If I know my heart, I am ready. Today, tonight, any day, any time, Lord. In thy glorious name, amen. Mm -hmm.